All right, thank you very much. <laughs> uh, it's lovely to give the fourth similar sounding talk <laughs> in one session and try to work out how to have slides that don't overlap with the things that have been said before. All right, <clears throat> does clinical research help me take care of my patient? Yes. And it's, uh, I don't know who, I didn't choose the title. Um, so will we go for beer? <laughs> or is it but? So this whole session has been about the but. Of course, clinical research in one way or another has been informing our practice forever. The problem is that we're getting bothered about certain aspects about clinical research today. So, as we've heard, clinical research follows a little bit of a hierarchy, and at the top of this hierarchy is this thing called the RCT. Uh, but the RCT has problems. Now, some of those I alluded to at lunchtime today, and so I will not go back over that area, but we know that they're too slow, hard, and expensive, and that's one of the reasons why, as we've heard from several of the speakers, we actually have too few of them. Uh, there's not enough RCTs to inform on many of the myriad questions. Uh, we also have this issue of being too broad and yet too narrow to be applicable. And then I'm also going to get into some issues of replicability and trust and the implications that that has for the way in which research actually then makes its way into clinical practice. Now, um, Anders, I think, showed the 2016 Surviving Sepsis Guideline. This is an older slide that I stole from Gordon Rubenfeld when he made a slide of the 2012 Surviving Sepsis Guidelines, which actually at that point had 115 separate statements. Now it's down to 93 about how to take care of septic shock patients. And in this slide, he nicely colors the fact that Having a lack of evidence didn't stop the sepsis mafia from feeling the ability to pronounce on exactly how you should take care of these patients. And I'm one of the co-authors, although I made no strong recommendations uh, in my section. Um, but a nice thing that Gordon did is that he went and pulled up in the top left uh, the AHA guidelines for taking care of cardiac arrest patients which, in theory, were informed by uh, a lot more evidence and data from many more decades, and yet the proportion of really strongly held recommendations supported by high-level evidence is no different. Critical care beats itself up all the time, and this is going to be a theme you have here, as if like, we're constantly looking to be holier than thou. We should give ourselves a break a lot of the time, we're no worse than many other fields. And we've met the enemy, and it is us. One of, one of the themes of my talk here is that we're sometimes waiting for too much certainty and too much perfect information. All right, so <clears throat> I showed this picture earlier of Archie Cochran, who said physicians have to stop making stuff up and just and, and follow evidence from RCTs. But remember, the average results from an RCT don't tell the physician whether that particular patient should receive a specific therapy. For example, I'm going to take an example you will all know and love, Zygris. One has to look hard to find a positive trial in critical care. Let's assume for a moment we could still give Zygris. So I just want you to go back a few years when we had the Zygris trial. Um, the trial and the follow-up papers would suggest that if you wanted to give Zygris to your patient, it would really depend. It would depend on the Apache 2 score. It would depend on whether they had pneumonia versus other sources of infection, whether the patient was in shock. It would even depend on age. Okay. Why is this? This is because the RCT is just giving an approximation the average odds of the average patient. All right, what happens in our minds? We tend to assume that that can be just deployed flatly to every patient. And then we either, we, we sort of fall into two camps. We either hate the EBM people who say you have to follow best evidence because they say, 
not every patient is average, my patient is different, or we're proponents of EBM and we say, how can you not follow the evidence? I just gave you a strong, <coughs> a strong recommendation. We had two RCTs and they were both positive. That should be a slam dunk. Everyone with these entry criteria should get the treatment. Okay, well, let's go back to a famous example from outside critical care. Close to, but outside critical care. <coughs> Carotid end arterectomy. So a bunch of vascular surgeons and neurosurgeons realized that they could fix cerebrovascular disease. If you took patients with asymptomatic carotid arteries with a little bit of atheroma, they said, we can go in and remove the atheroma. And they did the ECAS study, which you might remember, this large definitive RCT that said, if you went in and fixed this, you could cut the likelihood of, of having a stroke by 6%. Now, being surgeons, are there any surgeons in the audience? We're not recording this, are we? Being surgeons, they just assumed they could fix it. But, you know, not every surgeon has quite the same set of hands. And when you go in and you start trying to pull out clot, sometimes not all the clot comes out. Sometimes some of that clot goes north. All right. <clears throat> so what that means is, over on the left-hand side, on the y-axis, if you're doing surgery, if you do the same surgery lots of times over, a lot of the time you can offer benefit because you're removing clot. But several, sometimes you offer harm because you send clot into the wrong place. That is independent of the patient and is a fixed ratio of harm to effect of just you and your skills. On the, on the x-axis is the risk of having a stroke. And not everyone is going to have a stroke at the same rate. Some people have a certain amount of atheroma and a certain amount of risk factors, and they're many, many years away from their stroke. Other people are very close to it. And so the individual risk climbs over time, and the trial gives you the average risk. But everyone on the blue line who's down in the pink area is getting a net harm from the intervention, even though the average result of the trial was a benefit. So although you could have a positive RCT, even within the RCT, the intervention was killing or harming certain patients. And indeed, in this famous, this Edinburgh neurologist, Peter Rothwell, had this paper in The Lancet that launched the field of heterogeneity of treatment effect that said that even within a trial, you could have those patients with a less than 10% risk had a net harm from the trial. The average was around 6%, and then there was a few bunch of patients in the trial who got a very large gain. The really weird, quirky thing is that a lot of the time, we don't have normal distributions of risks in trial. We tend to over-enroll people at a low risk of the event, at a low risk of having the event. In other words, there's more people to the left than there are to the right. So you can actually even get the quirky situation where you get a net positive treatment effect because you change a small number of events in a certain subgroup of high-risk people, while on average, more people were harmed by the intervention than helped, even within the trial. So if we go back to the prowess trial, and this is why I picked Zygris. There's no other critical care intervention that does a multi-attribute, multi-variable model to try to model the risk of death and then the risk of benefit. But in this model that has uh, heptiles of events going from left to right, you can see that over on the right, it was the very sick patients that were getting a large benefit from Zygris. Over on the left, there was no obvious benefit. And actually, if you add up the number of patients, far more patients in the original prowess trial had deciles of risk, putting them at a risk of dying where there was no net change. The drug was doing nothing to the vast majority of patients in the prowess trial. All right. So if you go back and think, that was even within a trial, if you go back and think about all the patients you might want to treat as a big theoretical infinite population, I know I was talking about these infinite populations at lunchtime, and we're even closer to beer time and I'm doing it again. But imagine there's a theoretical infinite population 
And this is a population that will benefit from a therapy. So the mean benefit is plus 0.5 standard deviation. So there's a net benefit. You can see that the zero, i.e. this thing doesn't work, is to the left of the midline. It turns out, therefore, that lots of patients in green would be benefiting. Everyone clearly to the left of zero would be harmed. And then there's a gray zone around zero where it's a little bit hard to tell the net. So imagine this was like just adding up benefits and side effects. And the net gain is clearly obvious in green. It's clearly negative in red. And then there's a gray zone you're not quite sure. All right. When we do a randomized trial, there's different kinds of randomized trials we can do. So the ideal design would have a distribution in yellow, a small version that mimics the underlying population. And then you could look at subgroups, you could get estimates of treatment effect and heterogeneity going from red to, to green. What people often do is they try to get a very narrow patient population, and the weird thing is this would have exactly the same mean effect, but would hide, the, would hide whether there's heterogeneity, because there wouldn't be enough patients across the range of distribution. And furthermore, I think you all know this, we don't even try to do that population. We try to find that population. Everyone tries to find a very narrow, cherry-picked population. And if they're successful, there'll be no ability to get robust estimates of the heterogeneity of treatment effect. In fact, Nigel Longford, this English uh, statistician, said, a randomized trial is a cross between an experiment and a population survey with a haphazard sampling frame, which I thought was a great but disappointing <laughs> quote. All right, so what can trials do to contribute? So the first thing they can do is that they can conduct RCTs that are actually quite broad and have pre-specified analysis to understand heterogeneity of treatment effect. And then, as I alluded to in my lunchtime talk, they could also actually think about doing smarter trials so if they start out broadly and there's clear harm, they can shut it down quickly. All right, so let me move now from doing of the trials to receiving of the information. Because the title of the talk was sort of, how will it affect my practice? Trialists, in the minds of many, are in the business of selling snake oil. And they've been in the business of selling snake oil for a long time. Um, and so we've had some great talks, uh, such as the last talk, about all the ways in which someone could just be selling you snake oil. Most of this stuff hasn't really changed. I would actually argue that, if anything, the reason this looks old-fashioned is because we used to sell snake oil a lot, and we sell a lot less snake oil today than we used to. But despite the fact that overall our rigor and transparency is improving. I think you all know that we live in an era of alternative facts. And so at the same time as we're actually getting more transparent and more rigorous, and the process should be trusted more, if anything, the process is trusted less. So Dick Wenzel wrote this amazing perspective just about a week and a half ago in the New England Journal of Medicine. Um, it's quite interesting because he wrote it in the same week as David Brooks wrote a similar perspective about the Trump administration in the New York Times. And the points were almost identical, but, <laughs> but that's definitely for beer. So what he, what he really got at was he was actually nervous that in this era of mistrust, we're actually, we're, we're almost, um, how are we going to teach medical students and physicians to remember that part of the problem is we're, we're too sure that we want certainty. That it's actually important to maintain curiosity and maintain and tolerate uncertainty. And that we should resist turning false hope for certainty. Questions like, why do the RCT unless you, like, I don't like this RCT if it's not going to tell me the truth. He said, well, this is not the truth. It's a model giving a probability of truth, but it's not perfect. Oh, well, then I'm not interested. 
This is dangerous for us. The scientific process always embraced that you had some kind of theory, you held that theory until you disprove it. It's of course true that every RCT is false in the same way as every theory is false. In science, we're always going to be disproving theories, and we should remember that the, the scientific part of medicine should be accepting curiosity and uncertainty and not turning a false hope for certainty into mistrust and absolutism. And so instead, we should use the best current model, the highest level, highest quality RCT, and assume that it's not perfect. It's just the best we have right now, and then be willing to keep changing. So, do we do that? No, we don't. We mistrust what gets approved, and as we know, and you've probably all heard this, this uh, idea that it takes 17 years for something to make its way into practice. Um, someone actually tried to do a review about five or six years ago of this number, and it turned out that when they reviewed the literature, that was the number. It was actually 17 on average. But it was, in fact, highly variable, and certain things sped into practice. Hydrocortisone for septic shock, when <laughs> Jalali Anand published this paper, the United States ran out of hydrocortisone in three months. We ran out. Physicians are desperate to give steroids. Just give me the RCT that says I can give this patient steroid. And of course they are, because when they give steroids, it makes the patient feel better and all sorts of things. At the same time, you have something like Zygris, which five years later had only 0.05% market penetration. That was going to be a lot longer than 17 years had it stayed on the market. So what is the cost of delayed implementation? Well, in theory, patients miss the opportunity to benefit from new discoveries. When you decide to not adopt a new drug that's been approved, especially if you don't even discuss it with the patient, you've not even given the patient or the patient's family the right to opine on whether they would like to try the new drug. And then you could say, well, yes, but I'm protecting my patient while others find out if there's side effects. I'm not sure I want to trust this new drug. And so delaying implementation allows safety to be evaluated, though if no one's implementing the new drug, no one's evaluating the safety. So what you're basically saying is, trust me, you come over here, I won't give you the new drug. These other dudes can try the new drug, and then if someone gets a new second head or something like that, you'll be glad it wasn't you. All right, so two very famous economists at Harvard, David Cutler and Mark McClellan, who went on to run the FDA and then Medicare, um, wrote this paper about 15 years ago where they took several classes of medicines in several very active diseases, in cardiovascular disease and diabetes, etc. And they looked at the new discoveries, the implementation of drugs into markets, and then they factored in the fact that they were given to patients that shouldn't even get them. You know, the classic off-label use, so you're just spending money on drugs that people didn't need. And it turned out that it was still net worth it for human health. So, <clears throat> what is the rate of return from research, and how does the lag from the randomized trial to practice influence that rate of return? So there was a RAM study a few years ago looking in Britain at Britain's investment in cardiovascular disease research. So this was funding by the MRC, et cetera. It assumed a 17-year lag, and then it measured the gain in health and the wider economic benefits, and it expressed everything in pound sterling. They called that a monetary unit. After Brexit, I'm not sure a pound sterling will be a monetary unit, but be better off in Bitcoin. All right. Turned out that for every pound invested, there was a 9% return in health gained. And if the lag shortened to 10 years, you got a 50% increase in rate of return. And if the lag lengthened, the rate of return decreases. In other words, you pay for delay. Of course you do. Of course you do. So an error of omission, according to every patient safety guru, is ethically identical to an error of commission. So you'd feel very badly about cutting off the wrong leg. 
you should feel equally badly about not giving a proven therapy to a patient when they meet the indication. Logically. All right. So, is a new therapy a proven therapy? Given primum non nocere, given our adherence as physicians to trying to protect the patients, etc. Well, since 1971, the FDA has been getting it wrong on average 2.7% of the time. It's actually better than that in more recent years, but that's their error rate. So that means that if you just uh, you actually have a 97.3% chance of being wrong. Even though everyone remembers the disasters, on average, overwhelmingly, when new drugs are approved, they are actually approved appropriately. There's really not that many withdrawals. But we still decide that we're going to delay. We have a 17-year lag. So, assuming the system has built in primum non nocere. The system does. Peer review, FDA approval process. You can't just start selling snake oil. You have to prove the snake oil works in two RCTs, etc. Then um, we've already built in primum non nocere as an institution. When you have a therapy that's approved, um, we know that on average, new care is better than old care. So with individual therapies, we're worried about them. But who here thinks we should provide intensive care the way we did in 1960? So if you take the long view, no one is tolerant of old care. So no one in this room endorses really old care. But we quite like traditional care, and we're uncomfortable about adopting new care. The problem with that is that we are saying traditional is the same as conservative, when mathematically, traditional care is actually risky care. It's actually, uh, I know it makes us uncomfortable, <laughs> but the numbers would suggest that it's actually dangerous to keep doing what you used to do when the system has found a new way of doing things, that even if you don't like the appeal of it, if the drug company is sleazy in their marketing, if it's past our institutional bar for being safe and effective, then it on, it's actually risky to consistently be a laggard in adoption. And of course, this gets to these two gentlemen, which is the beginning of a whole other talk, but they are already drinking alcohol, and so should we. This is, of course, Amos Tversky on the left and Daniel Kahneman on the right, who themselves wrote Judgment Under Uncertainty on Heuristics and Biases about the importance of risk aversion. Daniel Kahneman made a more accessible book recently, Thinking Fast and Thinking Slow, and the lives of both of them are very nicely summarized by the guy that wrote Moneyball, who then got criticized after he wrote Moneyball because he hadn't considered all the heuristics and biases, and so he decided to go and learn about uh, Kahneman and Tversky. Okay, so in conclusion, RCTs can be the shortest route to change in practice because they develop, they provide the strongest evidence to generate change, but then, despite that, the lag is long and often variable. There are, undoubtedly, going to be large public health gains from faster adoption, but admittedly, it would be very helpful if, first of all, RCTs were more useful in the first place in terms of broad representation with a built-in assessment of heterogeneity. If the RCTs are incredibly narrow and can't inform us on our true patient population, then we don't have a good enough evidence base to adopt. And then, regardless, if they do their job and give us good evidence, it's good evidence, it's not perfect. It's still likely to be wrong. We have to be more receptive to uncertainty. Um, we have to better estimate risk and understand our own risk aversion. And with that, thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to start these uh, last minutes with uh, addressing uh, 
paper which uh, has been a lot in social media uh, the last year. Uh, you probably know it well. Uh, it wasn't published in JAMA, but in CHEST uh, <laughs> just before Christmas. Um, uh, some uh, authors uh, uh, suggested uh, from, from uh, observations in their own hospital that uh, a combination of hydrocortisone, vitamin C and thiamine uh, were beneficial for treatment of patients in septic shock. And, and what you observe when you uh, are on social media is that uh, the uptake of this therapy was actually quite quick. And I can say for a fact that uh, it is uh, now in use by some of our colleagues uh, around the world. Um, I guess many of us were surprised that CHEST published this uh, paper. Uh, and, uh, and of course the authors have tried to justify why it was done. But uh, could you give us some, some uh, thoughts about how this was seen in the uh, scientific community in the United States? Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of questions you could have asked about that paper. Um, uh, so Paul used to work in our department, Paul Merrick, um, and I've known him for a long time. And he actually emailed me to say, I have cured sepsis. Will JAMA take the paper? Um, and it was published in CHEST. Um, I'm sure he sent a similar email to Jeff Drazen. And uh, um, I think that paper, it's a brilliant question, that the paper absolutely got picked up in social media on EM crit. And it, this is what I meant about Dick Wenzel's piece on alternative facts actually alludes to the fact that there's something going on in medicine that is quite similar to what's going on in politics. There is something, go, a couple of issues are play. The lack of trust in institutions is huge. Existing, there's been institutional erosion in, sorry, erosion in institutional faith in government in the United States since Nixon. And it has been going down every year and it's dragging everyone down with it. The federal government is coming down, the NIH is coming down, large pharma was low <laughs> and falling, uh, but, but experts are losing credibility. Um, and there's been the rise of the blogger. And the paper in chest is like a blog. Paul is very charismatic when he gives his talk. And that paper is a perfect example of the blogging echo chamber. That, that it, it's a sort of grassroots, sounds good, bouncing around. Um, and it's very interesting. There's a big debate going on. We've had a big debate at JAMA about preprints, which is very similar to this. You just publish the whole paper on a server without any peer review. And um, there's pressure on the big journals to endorse preprints. But the problem is, papers change a lot during peer review. Some of them don't even get accepted. And um, there's pressure on the big journals to be relevant, edgy, young, on the internet, uh, Twitter, etc. And if they don't do that, no one listens to them. But if they do do it, they sacrifice peer review, and it's this issue of you need to be as fast as possible, but not faster. Uh, and I think the response in organized medicine in the United States to this vitamin C paper is the hope that it will just blow over. Um, people are very aware of the phenomenon. Um, no one is rushing to do a big RCT. We've had discussions with the NIH. Everyone was calling them, saying, should we immediately down tools on everything else we're doing and go out and do a big RCT on vitamin C and steroids and thiamine? And people have said, no, because the paper in chest isn't even good preliminary data. It's not even good phase one, phase two data for a phase three trial. OK, I've spoken for far too long. I, I have. This is, this is exact, you've asked in one question the heart of the issue, which I didn't even, 
I badly skirted around in my whole thing. But please read Dick Wenzel's... I actually always found Dick Wenzel to be stuffy, and I never, I never really felt like I liked him very much. And then, and then he wrote that piece, and I thought, oh my God, it's beautiful. It's, it's a beautiful read. And I found myself emailing him to say, this is like the best thing I've read in a long time. So 